Good evening, good evening, good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Oh, that's not bad. It's because it was gray. They don't have any sunshine in them. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Sorry. We'll get it for you next week. Well, we're excited to be here tonight for our second night in this series. Um, if you were here last week and you had a binder, I hope you grabbed your week two packet. If you had a packet without a binder, I hope you grabbed your new binder to add to your packet. Uh, and if this, this is your first time, you should have got a binder with two weeks of information in there so that you can have everything. Um, if you did not fill out a profile sheet last week, there's some out on the table. We would love to have those filled out. It just helps us to make sure we know where you are. Mm. You guys move mm -hmm. and you laugh, but like we can't find you guys sometimes. New email addresses, you have multiple children we know nothing about. So help us to know you better and fill out those profile sheets. And then in your binders or on the table, there was a little blue card with a QR code on it. That is the link that will take you uh, to the website so you can sign up. If being a adding membership, being a part of the membership process is something that you are here for, we would love to know so that we can start preparing. And Pastor Keith, let's talk a little bit about what that process looks yeah. like. A lot of you guys asked some questions about what is the membership process? You know, why do I need that QR code? Why do I need to go up and sign up if I want to be a member? And so we want to take some time and walk you through that and kind of work a little bit backwards. Every year here at Calvary in March, you know, uh, we do have a business meeting. And this year it's March 1st. And that business meeting there is where, you know, we talk about the finances for the church. We, we talk about what's budgeted for next year. But all those things have to be approved by the membership. And so that's when members come and they vote on that. And so that's the part that we want. We need to, if you want to be a member and want to be a part of the business meeting to be able to vote, we need to work back from that. And so March 1st is our business meeting. And so what we have to do is then set up uh, interviews with you if you say, hey, I want to be a member. Because the, through the interview process after that, we have to get board approval. Uh, and so... Uh, that that is kind of that process of interview and I know when I say interview some of you are like what do I have to do in an interview and this is fun you get to sit with somebody from our team and we get to ask questions good questions yes I think the most important one is usually like do you put pineapple on your pizza and the answer is no the answer is yes every no. time no no it's not this is why we can't have pizza at staff meetings anymore yeah we fight every time. You do not put pineapple But on. yeah, the questions are really just ways for us as a staff, as pastors, to get to know you guys better. Um, we love that we are part of a church with a lot of awesome people in it, but sometimes we haven't had a chance to stand in the atrium and get to know you, to hear your testimony. Uh, I'm, I love doing membership interviews because I get to hear your story. How did God become a part of your life? What did that journey look like for you? And it's different for everyone. And so it really is a cool time. And then you guys get to ask, you can interview us. Bring your questions. Uh, bring your interview questions. Does Pastor Keith like pineapple on his pizza? If I have you, I'll tell no. you yes every time. He no. loves it. No. Send him pizzas to his house. No. No. But like Leah said, it's a chance for us to connect with you and, and get to know you and you to get to know us as well. And then so that after that interview that we take that interview process and then we send it again to the board and the board then approves that part of it and says, hey, yes, they are able to be a member. And so what does a member get you at Calvary? You know, that's someone asked that question like, so am I like a member of a gym? What What is the expectations of, of media being a member? And we went over this a little bit last week and you'll start seeing even next week we'll have a covenant that we even have a covenant that you will read and sign and this is what it this is what it means to be a member but there are expectations of being a member and the first one is you know we ask that you attend church you know you attend not just any church but you attend the church that you want to be a member at and so that's important so you're attending calvary and you say hey that's why i want to be a member you know, we walked through this last week. Expectations of a member is their giving as well. Pastor Chad, you know, talked about tithing and our offerings. So that that is a big part of being a member. You're saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to do that part of it, be that. And then the other one is this is a key one is serving. You know, we there's that expectation as a member that you are serving as well. And uh, if you're serving and you're connected into a group, you know, and so, uh, you know, that mindset of serving. 
doing is, you know, we don't want you just to be a consumer. You know, uh, you, we want you to be an active part of the family. And that's the thing is I think we really, membership is a, is a word that gets used in a lot of different places, right? You can have like a gym membership, like you said, mm-hmm. or you can be like a membership of a cell phone plan or of a country club. But when you're a member at a church, it's really more about saying, this is my family. This is, these are my people. I am their people. And I don't know about your family, but at my family growing up, like there was responsibilities. Mm. I had to, I was the, I burnt the trash. That was my responsibility. We Mm. lived in the country. Wow. Yeah. And as a nine-year-old, going outside in the dark to burn the trash was like the least favorite job. You did it in the dark? Well, because it got, we live in Ohio. It gets dark at like 3.30. Oh, true. So after dinner, you know, a couple of the kids clean the dishes. And I guess by the time I was nine, I had graduated to lighting fire. (laughs) And so I took the trash bag out because that was my job as part of the family. And as part of the family, we ask that people attend church and that they give, but then they also serve because we are all an active part and we all do different things. Uh, If you guys notice, no one asks Keith and I to come up and sing because we are not the singing part of the body of Christ. We tried and they 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 told us. They take us every time, move us away. But we all have different gifts and we all have different talents. And that is the cool part when we are the family, the body of Christ together. Yeah. So if there's questions over the membership process, man, please stop us. Uh, And tonight, hopefully you'll get to understand that even more in the next couple of weeks. But we want to go ahead and jump into, you know, our, our core values our roots here and so we're going to invite Pastor Chad to come up and take over from here good evening Calvary somehow has it been nine years Leah when we did your employment interview the fact that you were a pyromaniac never came up and (laughs) that now is worrisome so Hey, last week we talked a little bit about uh, what we call our roots, and next week I'll kind of highlight for you a little bit why we call those our roots. We'll look at that, but um, our our core values and the things that really matter for us as a church, and we looked at the first one of those, which is the fact that... uh, Uh, We put God first in everything that we do. And tonight we're going to look at that second root in our values, and that is that people are the priority. And that's the second one that we'll look at here tonight. And uh, unpack that kind of from four different perspectives as we consider this. The first one is this. When we talk about the fact that people are the priority, the thing that matters so much to us in what we do, we know this, that we love people because God loves people. And the reason we love people and put people as a priority is because God loves people and he puts people as a priority. Does he not? You know the passage, right? In fact, <clears throat> it's probably one of the most well-known passages in all of scripture. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The reason in John three sixteen that God did what he did in sending Jesus, the reason Jesus came and died for us, all comes down to the fact that God loves people. Two, two quick Calvary stories. One, and you've probably heard this, there were five families, 1951, that made a decision. It was time for there to be a new church in Toledo. And the mantra that has come back kind of through the decades is that they said there's too many lost people and not enough churches. And God loves people. And our goal, our role, our our focus as a church is to love people and uh, to be a part of what God is doing in loving them and showing them who Jesus is. I remember when I came to be um, the kids pastor back in 1998, and our pastor was Doug Clay at the time. And I remember sitting in his office, and he was kind of giving me the... um, the lowdown, the orientation. He was kind of getting me, you know, schooled on what my job was and how we did things at Calvary. And I remember he said to me, look, one of the things that's important for you to know is that we don't have any sacred cows around here. Did you know what they mean by sacred cows? Like things that you just go, oh, you can't, you can't touch that or you, you can't do that or don't, don't mess with this or don't mess with that. He says, we're really not going to have sacred cows. He said, the only thing sacred at Calvary is people. Like, if, if you want to know what is the most important thing in what we do, it's that we serve people and that we love people and that we make people the priority. 
Because if God loved people enough to send his son to die, then we want people to be the priority for us as well. Which kind of comes to that next uh, kind of area there that we're, we're filling in the blanks on this sheet is that we believe that names are more important than numbers. We believe that names are more important than numbers. The reality is whenever you want to see the health of anything, at some point you measure the numbers involved with it, right? Like that's, that's anything. There's, there's something that at some point, especially if you're you know, a, a parent with a young child, Every time you go to the doctor, they're going to measure your child height and weight to see is there growth that's happening. So numbers are important. Like the numbers tell us things about the health of the church. But I, you probably have known churches. I've known churches where the most important thing is the numbers. How many seats are filled and how many people are giving and how many this and how many that. And all those, although all those things are important. We're more interested in the names, who people are, what God is doing in their lives, than just the numbers of the people that show up and are here. We're more interested in stories than seats. I'd rather hear the stories of what God is doing in people's lives than see how many people are in the seats. I heard a pastor say once, and I, and I really like this, we want to be a small church with a lot of people. And there's something about a small church that lets you connect it's a place where you know that you are known. It's a place where you know you can make an investment. And our hope is that in that same sense, Calvary feels like a place where you are known, where you know that God is using your gifts, even though God is sending more and more people to be a part of what he's doing in the church. And, and that's, that's one of the things that's, that's kind of key. I, I was glad that uh, Pastor Keith and Leah talked about the membership process. And I don't know... Um, I don't know what your experience has been in the past, but we do have a very significant process that we've gone through for years that not only includes the membership class, which is the information we're walking through, but then also you agreeing to a, to a certain covenant because we are being a part of something that's bigger than us. And if you're a part of something, you agree to kind of the standards of that group or that body, true? And so part of the things that we've done is to do that interview as a part of the process. And then our constitution calls for us to have a formal process that happens. So our board is involved in all things that have to do with membership at some point. And so all those things are important. That's why when we talk about the covenant, we'll talk about things like the importance of attendance and the importance of biblical stewardship and the importance of being connected or serving in some kind of place. And uh, I, I know some people go, that interview, that's kind of weird. Is that like going to the principal's office? And it's not, um, and, and there was a point in time where I, I, I don't know that I, I, I saw the value in the interview. Um, can, I, can I tell you a story? Like I was a part of a church once, it wasn't Calvary, where we had these two guys go through the membership class and they were friendly and they talked about Jesus and they, they shared what he had done in their lives and they're just really nice guys and everybody loved them. And, and so we, we had them go through the membership process. They became members at the church. And it was within a couple months later that we found out that these two guys, who we knew shared an apartment, also had a, can I say prostitute in church? Who, who also lived in that apartment where they were dealing drugs on the side. Which is when I said, huh, an interview would be a good idea, wouldn't it? Like that process of hearing your story and then you hearing the church's story and knowing how you can be a part of what God is doing at Calvary. So that's, that's a part of that whole process and uh, an important thing because we believe that everybody that's a part of the church matters. That's an important part of what we do. The, the next thing there is we're kind of rolling through these roots is, is an interesting thing. We fight for unity. We fight for unity. Have you ever, anybody ever been a part of a church fight? They're no fun, and I'm not interested in them. Like, as a shepherd, I, I'm not interested in just fighting over things. I was having a conversation with some leaders in, a, in another church recently, and they were going on and on about all the time that, that two ladies who weren't getting along in the church were, like, draining out of the life of the church. And at some point, I'm not interested in a fight. Anybody else? <laughs> What I'll fight for is unity because you have that passage there in Psalm 133 where God shows us that when there is unity, 
he brings his blessing and he brings his favor and he brings his anointing. Now, that doesn't mean uniformity, right? We won't always agree. We don't always have to be the same in everything. There will be times when we'll have different perspectives, but it does come down to us saying, we believe that God is leading the church, and so we will honor one another. We will respect one another. We are going to serve one another. We're going to grab hold of God's vision, and together we'll move forward. Does that make sense? Because, like, this is kind of important. Like, like, this isn't just me saying something. Like, like, does that make sense? <laughs> because it's, it's key for us. It's really important. And here's why. This is, the, this is the fourth thing, and we'll kind of wrap up here a little bit. We are better together. As a church, we are better together. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 says, Just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. And God has designed us to be better together. Next week, we'll talk a little bit about why that's so important for us as we serve and we are better together. We are the body of Christ, which is a huge theological concept. We're also the family of God, aren't we? Like, and so we're brothers and sisters in Christ. So we care for one another. We look out for each other. We love one another. It's funny though, there's another analogy we use. We're the family of God, but we're also the army of God. And in the army of God, we have responsibilities and we have roles and we serve together to see God's mission accomplished. And I think I'm kind of feeling kind of passionate about all of this because lately I've been thinking quite a bit about the role that the church played in my life. So a couple of years ago, I had the privilege to be able to go back and preach at my home church, Warren First Assembly, where I grew up. And I stood on the edge of that platform and as I was thinking about it, something struck me that if, if, you, if you were to draw a 10-foot circle around me while I was standing there on that platform, right there is where I gave my, nope, I'm messing that up. Right over there is where I gave my heart to Jesus and I was born again. Right there is where I was filled with the Holy Spirit and God changed my life. A little ways over there is where God really confirmed in my life a call to ministry. Right back here is where Rhonda made a bad life decision and I said, I do. <laughs> and right here is where I said goodbye to my dad when he passed away. And within a 10 foot circle in this one spot, some of the most foundational moments of my life all happened within that church. Now I know that's unique and I'm so thankful that I had that kind of experience. But even more than that, like 10 foot circle with that kind of gnarly blue carpet, even more than that, it was the people, it was God's power, and it was the role of the church in my life. And my hope is that it will be the church and the people of the church that you know are with you in the key moments of your life. Why what we're doing here on Wednesday night is so critically important is because literally right now, there's, there's hundreds of kids down on the other end of this building whose lives are being shaped, who are going to have a testimony of the role that Jesus plays in their life because he does that through his church. And so when we talk about this, even when we talk about membership, it, we, don't, we don't talk about these things or do this because we're a cult or we're some kind of weird club. We're not a cult no matter what some of your family has already told you. We are a family, and family comes with roles, and it comes with responsibility, and it comes with care and love for one another, and it comes with power and influence in such a unique way. And so I'm so glad you're here tonight. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing at Calvary. We'll, we'll talk more and celebrate more some of these things here in the next uh, couple of weeks as we go through this, but so thankful for what God does. So let, let's do this. Let, let's take uh, three minutes and kind of do this right where we're at. And maybe you turn in, in a group of three or four or whatever. But I'd love, I'd love for you to just kind of maybe put a bow on this before we talk about the next thing. Is if people are the priority in our lives, both as a church and as an individual, if we're going to love people the way that God loves people, how, how does that change the way we live, both as a church and as individuals? If people are people, you know people? You ever seen a person? Person? If people are really the priority, how does that change 
the way we see the world and the way we live. Let's take three minutes to talk about that, and then we'll start back up here in just a minute. Thanks. I think both times they've given me the come up and get them to stop talking job. <laughs> so 30 seconds, finish your last thought. All right, well, we are going to keep talking about how people are the priority as we spend a few minutes talking about missions. Um, if you've been here for a while, I hope that you know that missions is important to us here at Calvary. People are the priority both here in our community and around the world. And so you see that play out every week, every month, every year, as we encourage you to love the 419 or to love the world with us, uh, whether it's collecting school supplies or raising funds to help build a church. There are always ways that we are trying to show our love for people. Missions is a part of our DNA because we want to see the Great Commission finished. When you see in your book there, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, then Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always until the end of the age. We have been given this uh, great command from the Lord, and we are a church that wants to be busy in the business of seeing the Great Commission finished. For decades as a church, we have prayed for missions. We have sent people not only for short-term, but also we've sent so many people on long-term assignments to other places, other states, other countries. We have loved our community over and over and over again in big ways as a church and in small ways. I love when I meet one of you guys and you tell me where you serve in the community, a place that you volunteer and how we're loving our community. 
And we have given millions of dollars as a church to see the name of the Lord proclaimed everywhere. And I think over the years, um, as I grew up in church, it can be very easy to think of missions uh, as an occupation, right? Because a lot of times we'll have people who come up and say, I am a missionary, be like saying I'm a teacher, I am a businessman. It is their occupation. And so I think it can become really easy for us to think of an occupation of a group of people those are those, those are those people, right? The missionaries that pack up their life, pack up their families, and go to another country. But I want us to remember that missions isn't something that they do. Missions is a call that God has given each one of us. And so if you at any point in your life have said, Lord, I want to be a part of your family, this is a call that he places on each one of us. Not something that they do but something that we are all called to do. And so tonight, I want to just talk a little bit about what our role here at Calvary looks like when you are a part of our Calvary family and we say, man, people are the priority, how that kind of plays out. And so that first one is just that we pray. And the thing that I would encourage you as you think about praying for missions is to ask God to break your heart for what breaks his. And I will warn you, that is a very dangerous prayer. <laughs> Because you will find that if you truly pray it and you really are open to what the Lord has, that your heart can get broken in many, many pieces because the Lord's heart is so broken for us, for the, for the nations and the people who've never had a chance to hear, for your neighbor who lives next door and maybe was hurt by the church at some point in their life and doesn't want anything to do with God. You know, for the person who may be heard, but heard in the wrong way. Does that make sense? And so now their version of what God is in their head isn't quite right. And the Lord's heart breaks for all those people. But man, as we pray, ask the Lord to break your heart for what breaks his. I would encourage you to find maybe a country. Ask the Lord to give you a people group, maybe an unreached people group, someone that you can focus on and that you can pray for, maybe during your prayer time or stick a little note in your car as you drive to pray for these people, that the Lord would move there, that the Lord would move you there but that the Lord would do work and that his name would be proclaimed maybe in that nation or in that city or in that community. Maybe there's a neighborhood you drive through in Toledo on your way to work and you know there's people in this neighborhood that need to know about Jesus. So pray for those places and commit to stand with one of the missionaries that you've met along your way. We support a lot of missionaries here and so I hope that over the years, as missionaries come in, you hear their stories from the stage, maybe stop out in the atrium and chat with them, grab one of those prayer cards, and let that be the missionary that you choose to stand with. Maybe you do a different one every month or a different one every year, but allow the Lord to use your prayers. There are so many resources and tools uh, that you can use, too, that I would love to tell you about is that here at Calvary, we actually have a Facebook page for our missions and also a monthly newsletter. If you would like to get on one of those or receive those, you can find that information online or stop me in the hallway. But we are always sending out the prayer requests that we get from our missionaries so that you guys can know how to pray, so that you can be standing with them as they are on the front line each and every day. And when you pray, also ask the Lord how he would want you to give. This one can also be a dangerous prayer. They're both dangerous prayers because sometimes the way I want to give might look differently than the way the Lord wants me to give. Have you ever had that experience before? I think, Pastor Chad, you tell a really great story. It's not my story, but I'll tell your story of when you made the decision of what you wanted to give to missions, but you felt like the Lord wanted you to give more, so you left your wallet at home. Was that, that was your story, right? I'm not lying. No? Maybe it's Pastor Bill's somebody. I'm more spiritual than that, I think. Yeah. It's... It was your story. <laughs> but there are times where we're like, no, 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 Lord, I got this. I got this all sorted. I've, I've ran the numbers, and I know. Or I've looked at my calendar. I know how much time I can give. I know what is available in my calendar. But when we pray first and ask God, what do you want me to give to missions he might be asking us to make a bigger sacrifice than we are ready to make or that we think we can make. But I want to remind us, Philippians 4.19, he will supply all of our needs. Ephesians 3.20, he will do abundantly more than we could ever imagine. So this year, as you kind of launch into your pray, 
for a missionary and pray what the Lord would have you to give. And then second, I want to encourage us and remind us that we as a church, we engage with missions. And that can look different for everybody. Maybe the season of life, kind of where the Lord has you right now. But there are a few ways that we can engage with missions right here where you are, literally in your seat in this moment, uh, in your job, in your kind of season of life. So first, we're going to learn. There are so many things that are happening in the world. So search it out. Look and find what is the Lord doing in the world. A A quick Google search of missions and things that are happening, and you can hear all kinds of stories of the way the Lord is moving. But you can also grab a book, maybe make a friend that comes from a culture that is not your own to learn about other cultures and how the Lord is moving there. And find ways that you can learn about how the Lord is using missions. Our city is full of people that are from other places. And so often we can say, oh, I can't really travel to another country right now. But in our city, there are many, many countries represented. Maybe where you work, where your kids go to school. So find ways that you can learn. And then engage with how you live. When we choose to live with a missional lifestyle, the Lord can use us in so many ways. It's that idea that God has placed me here. He has planted me here. And so what can I do to shine the light with where I'm at right now? Have you ever had a job that you really didn't like, that you loathed going to every day? And if we change our mind into that missional mindset that the Lord has placed me here, and what can I do while I'm here? Whose life can I be a light to? Whose life can I change because of the moment that I've been placed here? And then you can keep praying about a new job too. But while you're in that job, remember and ask the Lord, man, Lord, how do you want this to be my mission field right now? And then we can, as we engage, we can love. Engaging with missions requires us to learn how to love people we have never met, these people that are all over the world who we've never met, to love people we don't understand, Sometimes maybe we don't understand their culture or their thought processes. And I think the hardest one is we have to learn to love people that we don't even like. And those are oftentimes the places that the Lord is asking us to shine our light. And so as you engage with missions, how are you learning about missions? How are you living that missional lifestyle? And then how are you loving right where you are? I really believe that love is that key that unlocks the door for so many people's hearts. That as we, as with humans with skin on, love them in maybe a way that doesn't seem normal because they're like, I know that person doesn't even like me. How are they loving me right now? That is the key that opens their heart for what the Lord wants to do. So keep that in mind as you walk through your daily life and you're praying, Lord, how can I be missional right where I'm at? So we, we pray and we engage and then we give. At Calvary, we believe, like we talked about last week, that the tithe is what we give to the Lord. We give back the first 10% of what he's given us. And then what we give after that, that is our offering. And through God's blessings and sacrifice and intentional living of so many people, we as a church have been able to see God do huge and miraculous things because of the way we're able to give. I did some research the other day. I knocked on our, on our finance door and I said, hey, I've never asked this before, but like, how far back can we go and look at the history of Calvary for missions? And so she did a quick search for me and what we can track that's just the computer, not like the paper files. She said I had to go through those by hand. I'll do that another day. But since the year 1999, we've given over $9 million to missions as a church. Guys, that's huge. That is huge because it's like Pastor Chad said, it's not about the $9 million, but it's about the millions and millions and millions of lives that have been changed. And sometimes, I don't know if you, I can't give $9 million. I don't have bank accounts that have that many (laughs) zeros at the back of them. But every gift matters to God because it's not about the gift. It's not about the size of the gift, but it's about that obedience that when the Lord challenges us to give that extra 20 or 40 or 100 or 1,000, that we are obedient to what the Lord has called us to do. So, man, I say, while you are growing your heart for missions and you're asking God, how can you use me? Pray, engage, and give. And you will be amazed at the things that the Lord will do, not only in your life, in your family's life, um, in your church's life, as we all do this together together. 
I put a little bit of instructions in there. Sometimes people will ask me, well, I don't know how to give to missions at Calvary. And so if you're ever wondering, uh, there's some instructions in there. And then in the next few weeks in February, we're going to be handing out kind of like our next big challenge for missions. What are we doing in 2023 for missions? And so I hope that in February, you'll grab one of our magazines and see the projects that we're going to be involved this year. And we're excited to see where the Lord is calling us to invest Today, I'm going to ask my friend Janelle to come up and visit with me. Uh, As we talk about missions, I wanted to bring a friend who calls Calvary home. Uh, Maybe you sit by her on a Sunday morning to hear her story of missions and how it has kind of played out in her life over the years. Janelle, thanks for hanging out with me tonight. Thanks for having me. (laughs) This is what happens when you guys get, everyone's going to be avoiding me now because they know there's another week. Leah's always making people come up and chat with her. Beware. (laughs) So Janelle, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then how did missions kind of play out in your life starting from very young as a kid as you grew up? Yeah, um, I grew up in a very missions-minded family. Um, My parents and my grandparents had personal friends who were missionaries, so they were always, you know, when they came through town, they often stayed at our house. We called them aunt and uncle, Um, and it was a big emphasis at our church growing up, too. I remember going to Sunday school and hearing the story of Amy Carmichael. And just how God used her life, even in his answers that were no to her prayers, that he used that um, for his glory and to help her be part of his kingdom work. Um, I think one of the coolest things as a child, um, my parents gave my brother and I both like big allowances. And we also had to contribute to expenses in the family. So we had to pay certain bills. And we each got to pick one of the missionaries that our family supported. And we wrote checks to that missionary. So even like from sixth, seventh grade, I was writing checks to support missionaries. I love the idea of, you know, your parents saw the value in teaching you as a kid. And then as you got older, uh, you had your own family. How did that kind of play out in that next season? Yeah, so um, our family actually ended up going to the Middle East um, to learn Arabic and then to be part of a church planning team overseas. Um, Yeah. And this was probably not in your grand scheme of things when you uh, were kind of starting out in life and getting married and having kids. But I love that when we talk about, when we ask and we, we pray and we ask the Lord, what are you calling me to do that you guys were open to kind of walk that path uh, Janelle is part of a ministry here in Toledo called Water for Ishmael, and it's someone that we as a church every month get to support, get to invest in. Um, and one of the cool things is that we talked a little bit ago about how in our community there are so many countries that are represented. In the city of Toledo, uh, there are people every day who are here from another nation. And Janelle, tell us a little bit about the work that you guys get to do and how even though we're here in Toledo, we're not getting on a plane and we don't pack a suitcase, that we can still be so active in sharing the love of Christ and in welcoming people. Yeah, it's really so cool. Um, Anyone you want to meet from any country, I can hook you up. (laughs) It's really such a privilege because we feel like our mission at Water for Ishmael is really to stand with the church, the big C church, the whole thing in Toledo, um, to really help them be all that Christ has called them to be. And so we kind of act as a handshake between the international community and the church community and helping them to be in relationship with one another and to know one another. So we do a lot of practical things um, that help internationals that are new to Toledo, but we do that really through the church in Toledo. We've had over the years many different people from Calvary who have gone to be a part of the work that's happening there, uh, whether it's you know, intangibles. My favorite's like the sewing room, like helping to actually, to teach them a skill that can not only help their family, but maybe to help them get established here in the community. But then even just sitting with someone and helping through the process of learning a language that is not their own so that they can go to the grocery store and buy food or walk into a bank and ask a question. Because if you've ever been to a country where you don't speak the language, it can be really hard to do just normal things Mm -hmm. (laughs) like navigate a neighborhood or read a street sign. And so there are so many different ways that as that love that we talked about takes place, that the key is going into their heart, opening doors and allowing the work of the Lord to really take place. 
Janelle, thank you guys so much for not only the, the investing that you do in our community, but the opportunities that you give us as a church to be able to walk alongside and to welcome people from so many communities. And thanks for just supporting us and being part of that. It's been amazing to work with Calvary. I mean, you've given us board members and volunteers. Um, you've given us finances. You've given us stuff. Um, and encouragement, so many things over the year. In fact, Calvary Church was the first church in Toledo to give. Um, they bought our first set of books for our English as a Second Language program way back almost 20 years ago. We will we'll keep finding ways to welcome these communities. Calvary, can we say thanks to Janelle for coming up and hanging out with us tonight? <laughs> I love a gadget. So does anybody have like lights in your home that you can control from your phone? You know what I'm talking about? You got like smart home stuff. You can talk to your Google or Alexa or whatever and don't turn lights on and off and all that kind of thing. So we've got, we've got some lights like that. And I don't know why I was looking at, at the app and I was doing something with one of the lights and I realized as I was checking it that every time I... I tell this light to come on, like I can just say, hey, t- turn on kind of thing. It's only coming on at 50%. And I kept thinking, like, that's kind of dim over there. It's kind of not right. And all of a sudden, I was like, I'm looking at the app, and I'm like, oh, well, no wonder I'm not getting much out of that light. It's because I don't have it turned up all the way. Do you, you know what I'm talking If you're walking in a room with a dimmer switch and, and there's not enough light, and sometimes you're like, I want more light, and that's really good. And then when you turn more light on, you also realize that there's more cleaning that should happen. Anyone else? And it's, it's good for me to say this is in my office at the house, not, not anywhere else. And, uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's it's better at 50%. <laughs> because what happens is the more light, the more you see things that maybe aren't the way that they should be. So we're talking about what we believe as a church. And we looked at this last week as a fellowship. So, so if you were to ask, who does the, the Calvary Church belong to? Like, are we a part of a denomination? We're part of a fellowship of churches called the Assemblies of God. And we talked about that last week. And one of the real values in being a part of the Assemblies or the AG, the Assemblies of God, is because it helps us to know what we believe as a church, what our theology is, what our doctrine And we have uh, what we refer to, kind of we boiled down the things that we believe to what we call 16 fundamental truths. We looked at six of those last week. We're going to look at four today. And and the first one we're going to look at, number nine of those 16 fundamental, we didn't skip seven and eight. We'll come back to them uh, on our last week. But number nine is what we refer to as sanctification. Sanctification. And what that means is sanctification is an act of separation from that which is evil and of dedication unto God. Sanctification is an act of separation from that which is evil and of dedication unto God. So here's, here's kind of a passage of scripture to help us with this. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what that's talking about here is when the light of Jesus shines in your life and that percentage goes up with how much you allow the light of the world to shine in you, you start to see more and more things that aren't pleasing to him. Anybody? (laughs) Like you begin to see that as more and more God has the, the, the control of your life, he's the Lord of your life, as you grow and develop in your walk with Christ, you also become more and more aware of the things that do not bring him glory, that do not show his lordship in your life. And there's a process of that, and we call that sanctification. That passage in Romans chapter 12 shows that we are becoming more and more like him Uh, We are offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. You don't conform to the pattern of this world, but you're transformed. And that transformation is something that keeps happening in our lives. True? Like he's always working in our lives. And this leads us to a a concept that's really good for us to talk about. And it's, it's just what we would refer to as holiness. This idea 
that uh, we are called as God's people to be holy. You'll, you'll see this word holiness a lot in the Old Testament. You see it a lot in the New Testament. One of the places where Paul has to deal with this is when he um, writes the, the letter to the church that's in Corinth. Several years ago, we did a, a, a series of messages where we walked through some of the key themes in First and Second Corinthians, and we, we called that series of messages messed up. Because if you want to see a church that was messed up in some ways, read 1 Corinthians. Anybody ever read it? I mean, you just think of the things that Paul has to address in that church. He has to talk about idolatry. He has to talk about sexual immorality. He has to talk about the way they were testing God. He has to talk about their grumbling. He has to kind of push back on some things and call them to a place of holiness. Aren't you glad those things were only issues in the church in Corinth? I mean, these are the same things that we walk through in our culture today. So when we talk about holiness, what do we mean? Here, we'll fill in some blanks here. To be holy means to be set apart from ordinary and evil use and devoted to glorifying God. That we look at our lives and we say, and that word holiness gets a bad rap. It, it sounds like something that's old-fashioned or antiquated or no fun. When actually what holiness is, is saying, I know that I belong to God it's not just an ordinary life. It's certainly not an evil life. It's a life that's devoted to glorifying God. It does mean that if we're going to be holy, that we're going to be different. If you live for Christ, are you different from the world around you? Yes or no? <laughs> and did you notice I used the word different and not weird? Can I get an amen? I'm not called to be weird. We'll hit that in another sermon. But like we're called to be different. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. So Paul there in 2 Corinthians is quoting from the Old Testament. And he's saying, we've been called to be holy. So because we're holy, we will live our lives differently. I've been privileged to officiate a whole lot of weddings over the years. And my typical practice, if I get the chance, it doesn't always work out because of timing or the, the venue or sometimes the people involved. Yeah. But if I have the opportunity, one of the things I like to do is kind of just before the ceremony starts, I like to go in the room wherever the, the bride has prepared herself and, and go in with the family and have a word of prayer with the bride and the bridesmaids. And it's just kind of a special moment to be able to go in and, and in my role as pastor, pray with the, the bride and the bridesmaids before kind of that, that big moment. I try to do the same thing with the groom, but I'll, I'll tell you this. I've done a bunch of weddings, and I've never walked into that room and seen the bride just kind of sitting there in her white dress that was overpriced. Amen? <clears throat> I've never seen her sitting there in that white dress just kind of chilling with her bridesmaids eating a chocolate ice cream cone. She's not going to do it. She's not going to risk it. That's completely unwise. How foolish would it be if you are the bride and you are about to be presented not only to your groom, but to everybody that's come to see this important event, that you would eat in that moment something as risky, and those, those rooms are usually warmer than they should be. <laughs> How foolish would it be for you to eat something as risky as a chocolate ice cream cone. You wouldn't risk it because you're the bride and you want to present yourself to your groom without a blemish. And that's a picture of holiness because are we the bride of Christ? And we're to be presented to Christ who is our groom. And so many times I think as we live our lives, we live our lives in a way where, where we, we don't think that we're to be different from the world around us, and we kind of sometimes play kind of fast and loose with the morals of the world around us and not realize the risk that that brings to how we will present ourselves to Christ. One of the things that's key, and, and we see this, the faith we live out will separate us from the world we live in. If you live out your faith, you will be different than the world that's around you. The reason that God says to Israel over and over again in the Old Testament to be holy is so that other people will see that they belong to him. Not just because he's boring and wants you to follow rules. In fact, his rules 
are things that bring joy and peace and, and his presence and honestly ease to your life when you follow his rules, even though they might not be the rules of the culture of the society. But the reason he says to Israel and the reason he says to us is, I want you to live a life that's holy is not only because that's of benefit to you, but also because it identifies that you belong to me. And the faith we live out will separate us from the world we live in. I, I wear my wedding ring and uh, I wear it everywhere I go. I wear it all the time. I have just taken it off, but I am still married, right? <laughs> like that, I, I, did, I took it off, but that doesn't mean I'm not married. We're, you're still good, baby. Um, <laughs> like I'm still married, but I don't have that symbol right now. It doesn't change that. But this wedding ring, when I wear it, shows everyone that I'm taken and I'm a lucky man, right? And that I belong to somebody. I'm not married because of the power of this ring, but this ring is a symbol to show that I'm going to live my life in a certain way because I'm devoted with my full heart and my full life to someone else. Holiness is like your wedding ring because when you choose to live your life in a way that honors God, that, that lives a life that's according to scripture, it's like you're putting on that wedding ring and saying, God, because I belong to you, my life will reflect that in the way that I live. Some of you may have been a part of a, a church or a background where everything was all about the rules. And sometimes maybe you've even heard the term where, where, where it can become legalistic. And the reality is, you can have holiness without relationship. Like you can have all kinds of rules and regulations and follow those things and truly not be in relationship with God. Everybody, anybody ever known a, a setting like this? That's a whole nother subject. But I'll tell you this, you can't have relationship with God without holiness. Because if you truly are in relationship with him, won't you want to live in a way that pleases him? And so let's talk for just a moment. You know, there are some things, and we've, we've talked about this, and we'll, uh, we'll add to the website before we're done with these classes, maybe some resources that'll help. We, we talked about holiness a couple of years back and, and looked at some of these ideas. And one of the things that we use this kind of a concept to help us as we're on our journey is there are like green light issues, yellow light issues, and red light issues, right? So some things are these green light issues. And you just know they're a go. They're good things. Like, should you love other people? Yes or no? <laughs> should you share your faith? Yes or no? Should you follow biblical principles with your finances? Yes or no? Like, I mean, we could, we could go on and on. Should you, um, should you smile at the pastor in the atrium? Yes or no? Yes, please. Please. Like, so these are green light things. There are also some red light things. There are some things that you just look at from Scripture and go, Hey, that's a, that's a no, that's a stop, that's, that's a direction we, we just don't go. And there are some red light issues. And, and those are things that are good for us to, to talk about, to think about, to keep in mind. I mean, where's, where's the clearest expression of those? You have some red light issues in the Ten Commandments, don't you? I mean, that's, that's crystal clear. Should you steal, yes or no? Should, should you kill your neighbor, yes or no? <laughs> no, right, it's that clear. Now, some of these red light issues, though, are red light issues in Scripture, but they're not in culture, right? And let me, let me just give you a, 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 maybe a timely for instance, right? When we look at Scripture, and this is probably, if you're considering membership at Calvary, this is probably good for you to know. When we look at Scripture, we see that Scripture gives us a very clear kind of boundary with regards to to sexual practice and marriage. And what we see when we look at scripture is that God's definition of marriage is one man and one woman committed in a relationship for life just with each other. And all sexual activity is reserved for marriage and anything outside of those, those bounds of God's definition, scripture refers to as sin. Do, do you see where that's a red light issue? In the sense that God's word is very clear. But you can have God's word be very clear 
and still have laws in a land that communicate something different, right? That laws say, oh, no, no, that's, that's okay. You can do that. You can define words in a different way, or you can say this is okay, or culture says that's all right, or I saw it on a TV show. It's okay. You can do those things, right? We need to be careful that the laws of man never take a precedent over the laws of God, true? Right? So that's where we got to go, hey, some things are red light issues, and Scripture speaks very clearly to those things. Then sometimes you've got what, and I think you've got this here in your handout, what we would call yellow light issues, Yellow lights are interesting because when you come up to a yellow light, you have a decision to make, right? You have to decide what's, what's best. Green means go. Red means stop. Yellow means speed up, right? <laughs> Get through there. <laughs> or does it? Right? I was, I was driving the trail last week. I, I guess, I don't know how long ago it was, but I was on the trail. And I remember there was one light, and I was coming up to it, and it turned yellow. And I went, actually... It was raining. It's better for me if I go through there right now. This, you, you get a gauge, don't you, on distance and what's wise? But the very next traffic light did the same thing and turned yellow, and I, and I had this just internal sense to go, no, I need to stop for this one. Right. So there's yellow light issues that sometimes there, there's not a clear right or wrong. Yellow light issues are questions of conscience that may not have a clear right or wrong answer. And that's where we need to think through certain things with the help of the Holy Spirit. So th those are yellow light issues. I'll, I'll give you some for instances that, that, that might be interesting. When I went to Bible college, right? And, and remember I told you the telephone had just been invented. Do you remember that? I mentioned that. When I went to Bible college, we weren't allowed to go see movies. Like we just, we couldn't go at all. We weren't allowed to have um, televisions in our dorm rooms. There were some different things like that. Was that a sin? Now, by the time you went to Central Bible College, Pastor Jordan, those, those restrictions had been lifted. Yeah, and I noticed graduates from your era are much more sinful. And so that's <laughs> like, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, right? Was it a sin to have a television in your room? No. But that was the that was community stand, right? There's, so you, you got these different things that you go, what, what's that? There are things like when people ask questions about, what about alcohol? When people ask questions about, and, and this is going to become more and more prevalent in our culture, right? Like when I was in high school, it was dancing, right? You know what? You, you, can, you can kind of move back and forth, but if you lift your feet at all, you are not going to heaven, right? That's the, right, those things. So you have these yellow light issues. Here's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. I have the right to do anything, you say which you can't have freedom in Christ where, where that's true. I have the right to do everything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So Paul helps us. He does it here in 1 Corinthians. He also does it in the book of Romans to go, look, there will be matters of conscience that will come that in and of themselves might not be sin, but how you approach those things can either be sin based on your attitude in your heart or they could be a stumbling block. Have you ever heard that term? So what we looked at several years ago, and we'll just, we'll just kind of throw this out here, is what we call a GPS that is a compass for navigating our challenging times. So when you come to one of these yellow light issues where you go, is God okay with me doing this? Is, is God not okay with me? Do, should I do this? Is this a sin? Is this? Here's a couple of things. GPS which is a compass for navigating challenging times. Here's the first question. It has to do, letter G, with God. And to ask the question, if I do this, does this glorify God? Like, does, does, does this glorify God in my life? If somebody else were to see me at this place as a part of this activity, take part in this thing, would they look and say that that glorifies God? Am I glorifying God through this? So ultimately, it's, it starts there. The letter P then in GPS is people. And we have to ask, does this encourage or discourage others? If the letter P is people, does this encourage or does it discourage others? That's a whole other conversation. And Scripture, Paul, places a really high value on the fact that I can do whatever I want. But if doing that offends my brother, then that's something I should not do. When I was a, 
when I was a, a custodian in a high school back in Bible college, I worked with the guy who had, prior to becoming a Christian, been like, uh, like a just spaced out hippie, like drugs and bad decisions and the whole, like he had stories to tell. And then he like had an experience with Jesus where he was just transformed and changed and just kind of radically saved, like radically saved. Everything changed in his life. And one of the things that was really interesting was he had in his before Christ days listened to and just loved like kind of like rock music like you couldn't believe. Like that was just that was just his world. When he got saved, people started introducing him to contemporary Christian music, to Christian rock music, to hey, here's a good alternative to the music you used to listen to. What was interesting was for him in that season of his life, even though the words for him were about Jesus and they were songs of praise and how to live a life that was pleasing to God, he couldn't listen to the words because the beat of that music was a hindrance to him. Wasn't a hindrance to me. I loved it. For me in that season of time, listening to what we'll just call Christian rock music was an alternative. It actually built me up. It actually was an alternative for me. It was a really good thing for me. The problem was it was so familiar with his past that it became a temptation to him when it was a strengthening to me. Does that make sense? So when I was with him, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a sin for me to listen to Christian rock music. It was actually a good thing. But when I was with him, it was actually bringing temptation to my brother. So I had to choose, even though I have the liberty to listen to as much Petra and DeGarmo and Key as I want to. Can I get an amen? Anybody remember that? Back when music was music. I, I, even though I can listen to as much of that as I want to, if it offends my brother, I'm actually sinning and selfish and foolish to put that stumbling block in his, in his life. Are you with me? So, so interesting. Okay, last one. Letter S is self, right? Does this cause me to be closer to, to or further away from God? Does this cause me to be closer to or further away from God? And the reality is, like, if our relationship with God is here, right, we can make decisions that aren't sin, but can have a tendency to pull us away from him, to create a distance between us and him that are an unhealthy thing in our lives. So when it comes to these yellow light issues, it's good for us to ask the questions, does this glorify God? Does this encourage or discourage others? And does this cause me to be closer or further away from God? So you've got one other statement there that, that's good to look at. Do you see in your, in your handout where it says position papers? This is a good resource that comes from the Assemblies of God. The web link is there where our fellowship has published what they call position papers that are things that help us to kind of know how do we handle some cultural issues. They're going to be a reflection from Scripture. They're going to be the stance that we have as a fellowship. Um, they're not our doctrine, but they're just helpful cultural resources. And uh, if, you, if you have questions, I'll just rattle off real quick. They've got one on gambling, one on creation, thoughts on divorce and remarriage, domestic violence, sexual identity, abortion, suicide, spiritual warfare, the role of women in ministry, transgenderism. So if you want to know what we believe is a church, but then also a scriptural backing from some theological minds on how to think about it, that's a really cool resource and would encourage you to check it out. So that's number nine in the 16 fundamentals that we talk about, sanctification. I want to invite Pastor Jordan and Pastor Keith to come, and uh, we're going to talk about a couple of more before we wrap up here tonight. We want to get through three more of our uh, fundamental truths tonight. And so number 10, and uh, Pastor Jordan, do you have number 10? All right. Uh, why don't you introduce it to us? All right, well, uh, number 10 is called The Church and Its Mission. Growing up, I had this friend that I would always invite to church, and uh, his name was Jake. And I'd always be like, hey, Jake, you want to come to church with me tonight? Or you want to come on Sunday? And just always invite him. And his response was always, no, man, I'm good. It's like, I, I believe in Jesus. I believe the same thing you believe. 
but I just don't believe in like the corporate gathering together. It's like, I don't believe that that's for me. And what Jake didn't understand was he really had a bad interpretation of what the church was and what its mission was. And because of that, he didn't want any part of it. So we believe in the Assemblies of God that the church is the body of Christ, the habitation of God through the Spirit with divine appointments for the fulfillment of her great commission. Each believer born of the Spirit is an integral part of the general assembly in the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So we really believe in, in all of this is that God has a purpose for the church. And so since God's purpose concerning man, there's, there's four things that we believe in the assemblies of God that are God's purposes concerning man. And that's simply that God is concerned with men to seek and save that which is lost. And then to be worshipped by man, to build a body of believers in the image of his son, and to demonstrate his love and compassion for all the world. And so those are the fourfold like purposes that God has for us as individuals. But because of those, then there's four more purposes that God has for the church. And so the priority reason for being of the assemblies of God as a part of the church is to be an agency for God uh, for evangelizing the world. You know, Leah just got up here and talked about missions, and we believe that the church is to be an agency. God wants to use us individually to seek and save the lost and individually, but then corporately as a church, we're an agency for evangelizing the world. And then also uh, to be a corporate body in which man may worship God. So again, the first one that God has for the second one that God has for us is to be worshipped. God desires our worship, but then he also wants the church to be a corporate body in which we may express our worship to him. And then third uh, is to be a channel of God's purpose to build a body of saints being perfected in the image of his son. So again, the third one that God has for us individually is to be to build a body of believers in the image of his son. And then the third one is to channel these purposes to build a body of the saints. So we can use one another's strengths and weaknesses to build this corporate body together. And then lastly, to be people who demonstrate God's love and compassion for all the world. And so again, it relates back to what God wants to do in us. He also wants to do in his church. I think it's really interesting that, you know, we talked last week, God has all power and God can do anything. And of all the ways that he chose to make himself known and to accomplish his purpose, he picked you and me. Like he picked us and he picked to, to do this so that the, the world would know who Jesus is through his church. And that's kind of frightening for anybody else. <laughs> like that's a responsibility that we have for him to do that. And I, I shared my 10 foot circle story here a little bit, but, and, and we don't have time for everybody's story tonight, but I know that your life has been shaped by the church and your life was shaped by the church and that, that God works in tandem with his people to accomplish what he's doing. And uh, I, I just, I don't ever want to sell that short. And, and as pastor, I, I hurt when I hear people's stories that say, well, the church wasn't always that for me. Yeah. And our prayer is that Calvary will be a place um, that's a church that's filled only with perfect people. Can I get an amen? <laughs> We're not. Like, you're going to get let down, and there's a good chance that I'll be at the top of the list of people who let you down. But even though the church is filled with imperfect people, that we work together as the Spirit works through us, and especially that Calvary will be, will be a place that because of the church will know God better. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a daunting, like, thinking through all of those things. It's kind of daunting, like, oh, my gosh, like, God wants all of this of me, and then he wants all of this out of us. And, and the cool thing about it, and if you were to read this in the, in the fundamentals as they're listed, is that the, 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 the next half to this is that really the Holy Spirit helps us. You know, because we're a Pentecostal fellowship. Like, we believe in the Holy Spirit's work. And so as we have this really daunting thing that we're like, okay, God, you want to use me in this way, it's not just this individual, I've got to be perfect, you know, or, uh, but, but we get to rely on the Holy Spirit, and we get to receive his help. You know, he's an advocate that works for us, and so we can go out into all the world, and we can, you know, be the church and fulfill his mission. 
All right, so we got number 11 next, and that's the ministry. And that says that a divinely called and scripturally ordained ministry has been provided by our Lord for the fourfold purpose of leading the church. We see in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be, may be built up until we all reach in unity in faith and in knowledge of the Son and God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So you see in there the full the fourfold purpose. And so what is that? You know, the first one is evangelization, eva sorry, evangelism to the world. And this means this, we bring the, you know, Jesus to every person. And so we see this in scripture in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 20. It says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So that is the ministry. That's the purpose right there. And then the next one is the worship of God. And another one is building, the, next, the third one is building a body of saints perfected in the image of God, like what Pastor Jan Jordan just talked about there. And then the last one there is meeting human needs with ministries of love and compassion. And so that last one, I really love that we're, we're going to meet human needs with ministries, love and compassion. And that's what ministry is all about is having that. Okay, how do we meet people? How do we get their needs? How do we help them to see Jesus? And, you know, and so this is, that's the ministry and that's what the Assemblies of God believes in right there. And the last one that we're looking at here tonight, number 12, is divine healing. And it's divine healing. Uh, the, the statement that's here says divine healing is an integral part of the gospel. Deliverance from sickness is provided for in the atonement and is the privilege of all believers. Um, and uh, we believe, I think it's good for us just to affirm this, we believe that Jesus still heals, yes? And uh, I know I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in some of your lives. I've seen it when God has stepped in and uh, when he's done uh, I, I've, I've been there as the, as the doctor looks at the scan and looks at me and says, it really shouldn't look like this. I'm not sure why it looks like this. And I'm like, I know why. It's because people prayed and because Jesus heals and he touches us. Um, I, I know this is, a, this is a, a topic that we could spend a ton of time on. Can I throw out a couple of questions real quick and maybe you can help me answer them? Um, here's the first question. Can Jesus heal? Yes or no? Yes. We believe this. The Bible tells us that over and over again. Psalm 103 says he not only forgives all our sins, but he heals all our diseases. The Bible tells us that it's by his stripes we are healed. It's a part of what he did for us on the cross. And so we believe that. Here's the second question, and, and this is key because we're going to pray for healing tonight. If question number one is can Jesus heal, question number two is will Jesus heal? And he will we also know that sometimes um, he may not. Like sometimes we pray. Have you ever prayed with someone for healing and they weren't healed? That's because you didn't have enough faith. I'm glad you laughed. Like the number of times that someone has come to me and said, Pastor, I prayed for healing and I didn't get healed. And my friend told me it's because I didn't have enough faith. And I said, can I punch your friend? Look, God is sovereign, is he not? Yes. I've seen God heal someone the very first time that they were prayed for. And then I've also seen people pray a long time before they were healed. And I also know we prayed a long time for my dad. And for whatever reason, God chose not to heal him. And I don't know that I always understand the mind of God. I do know when we get to heaven... If we care enough to ask those questions, I'm not even sure we'll care enough once we're in the presence of the Lord. But if we care enough to ask those questions, he'll roll out the big timeline and we'll go, oh, God, you're so good. Because you're perfect and you make wise decisions. The third question is, why does Jesus not always heal? I don't know. I know, though, that there is a God who can be trusted and that the God of all the earth will do what is right. True? Scripture tells us this. And I know that we can trust him. I know that his timing is different than mine and his healing is different than ours. And I know sometimes that when we pray for healing, the healing he brings is not in the way that we would ask for. And yet, my dad's healed. My dad does not have cancer. 
And my dad does not have any sickness. And he's healed. And I wish he was healed here, but I know he's healed in the presence of Jesus. True? Amen? Right? I I know this, right? So these are questions that sometimes I bring them up because sometimes people aren't even willing to pray for healing because they start and they say, well, what if he doesn't? Or what if he chooses not to? Or what if, what if, what if? Here's the deal. Here's the fourth question then in all of that. Should I pray for healing? Yes or no? Absolutely. Don't let your questions second guess what God might do. I know God can heal. I know he will heal. And I know that I trust him to put that in his hands. This is why James 5, 14 says this. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so tonight, we want to pray for healing. Amen? And we're going to believe for that. So I'm going to invite, we have some of our uh, pastoral team, we have some of our board members that are going to come tonight, and uh, we're going to pray together and believe that God is a God who heals tonight. And uh, um, I know that that's not everybody. I know that some of you are here even specifically tonight because something going on in your body and you would say, God, I need a healing. Some of you are here tonight and you specifically have someone in mind, a family member or a friend, and you would say, God, I know that they need a healing in their body and we're gonna pray together for that tonight and we're gonna believe by faith that Jesus can heal us. Would you stand with me tonight? We're, we're gonna do this a little bit different. It's, uh, it's 819 and um, we're actually not gonna go into a time of worship. We'll have some music that will play. Um, but tonight, I, I just want to invite you. We're going we're gonna to do this in a very kind of simple and, and unique way. We'll have some of our team members that are just, uh, and if you guys, thank you for scooting down, and we'll spread out here and uh, make as much room as we can for as many people. And tonight, if you would say, I would love for someone to pray with me for healing, then I'm going to invite you to come. And uh, just if you can come to kind of the first available one of our uh, board members or our, our pastoral team, if you can just come and just kind of find that first available person and just very briefly um, just kind of share with them, hey, this is, this is what I'm asking for. I, I have a bad toe or, or whatever it might be. You don't need to pull out the scans on your phone. Amen. No need to open my chart or, or, or okay. Just just to share that, just kind of what's, what's good to share so that we'll know how to specifically pray. And then, and then we're going to specifically pray for healing. We're, we're not going to do anything weird. We're just going to do what the Bible says. We're going to anoint you with oil. Why oil? Because it is a symbol throughout scripture of healing and of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to anoint you with oil and then we're going to pray the prayer of faith. And uh, God may miraculously do something in the moment or you might not feel anything at all. Like you might have symptoms disappear or maybe this is a part of a healing process that God's working in your life, but we're going to come and we're going to pray because we believe that Jesus heals. Amen. So here, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to have like a formal dismissal tonight. Um, I, I don't want you to feel any pressure to hustle. I don't want you to feel any pressure to stay. I would say if, if you have kids, uh, we've, we've promised those wonderful people that, uh, they'll be they'll be free about 8 30 and so if you could keep that in mind if you're picking up um children tonight that are involved in our kids ministry but we would just ask that you would come if if you're not praying with or for someone tonight for healing you are free i'm going to pray here in just a moment you're free to go whenever you feel released the lord if you want to stay and pray with some people if you want to take the opportunity to encourage someone whatever that might be in these next few moments you're you're welcome um to do that we've got eager beavers amen and uh, so we're gonna pray together and so i'm gonna pray and if you'd like you can come we'll line up kind of in just some natural ways along the way as we go but we're gonna pray together and believe that jesus heals us father we love you lord we're your people And Jesus, your word says that you went about doing good and healing everywhere you went. And so would you heal here tonight? Would you touch bodies? Lord, would you heal minds? 
God, would you do the miraculous that only you can do? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here. If you'd like prayer, come on down and join us. We're going to pray together. We'll see you on Sunday.